It is a delight to see you this evening, and uh, thank you so much for coming into the service tonight and being here on time. You are on time. Uh, everyone else is tardy. Dr. Churchill. Okay. Uh, no, I can't do that to him. I cannot. Uh, but anyways, uh, we have really just been enjoying the presence of the Lord in these services. God met with us in a powerful way last night in the singing And uh, then again, today in the service this morning, uh, God came in a special way. There was a wonderful altar call, and uh, young people responded to that. And we give God praise, and we're expecting him to just help us, continue to help us tonight. And uh, so let's do our part. Uh, Let's just be obedient to him as he would speak to us in this service. Let's stand together and invite God's presence to settle in our midst. Heavenly Father, it is a privilege to be in your house tonight. We're thankful, Lord, for the refreshing rain. We're glad, Lord, that has passed through now, and we've been able to come in uh, to your house tonight dry, and we're grateful for that. But, Lord, we're asking that the showers of blessing would just come over this service here tonight, that your Holy Spirit would just rain down upon us, and, Lord, that you would have your will and way in the hearts and lives of everyone present. And, Lord, for what you do, we would just be careful to give you praise. In fact, Lord, we just want to do that right now. We want to thank you in advance for what you're going to do for us in this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's do our best in the singing this evening. Brother Tim Cole is coming to lead us in the singing. Amen. Good evening. Thank you, let me say, for singing so well this week. You know, I don't have years and years of experience, as Brother Glick does, in in leading music and perhaps some of you others, but I've been doing it just long enough to know that if you sit there and don't sing, there's no place I would rather don't would want to be I don't want to be up here and sing to empty pews and I don't want to see you uh, with a dead face but thank you for entering in and doing your best to to worship and lift up the name of the Lord I know you're going to continue to help us we're singing songs of victory tonight this first one says at Calvary there was mercy that was great and grace was free thank the Lord for the cross tonight thank the Lord for Calvary will you sing it out with me tonight
continue to sing well. We're singing another familiar song. I don't know that we could make it through a revival in a camp meeting without singing about victory and Jesus. One of my favorite parts of the message that we have is victory that we can have all the time. I'm thankful for victory in Jesus. When he saves us and cleanses us, he can keep us victorious. Praise the Lord. Sing with me tonight, Victory in Jesus.
Amen. Aren't you glad that you can testify to that tonight? I don't care if you've been serving the Lord for a day, for a week, or for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I'm glad that we can say it's just sweeter today than it was the day before. And, and realizing that even in the valley, even in the valleys, God is good. He's, he's there with us and he helps us. And uh, I know there's many in this congregation that's faced things a lot deeper than I've had to go through. But I've, I've had a joy in watching how you've shown the love of Christ in your life. And you've come through with the reality and the testimony that even in the valley, God is good. He's there with you every step of the way. And uh, when we get a little discouraged about what's going on in our life or around us, there's just something that we cannot get away from. And that's the Creator God. He's with us. And His Spirit can be in us. And we can have Him close. And that is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And tonight, we're going to prayer and we're going to the One who knows all things and sees all things. He knows the burdens that you carry, the things that are on your heart and mind. And we just want to give you just a couple of a couple of requests before we go to prayer. We want to pray for John and Lisa nicely. This would be Aaron Merriweather's in-laws. Um, if I understand correctly, they're having to be evacuated from where they live. Some fires that are some things that are taking place there. So let's pray that God would be with them. And then we also want to continue to pray for little Paisley. Little Paisley was born to Paul and Rachel. Now, many of you may not know them, but Paul and Rachel come faithfully on a Wednesday night, usually sitting right back there. Uh, just like clockwork, they come, and, uh, and you're going to have a wonderful opportunity, hopefully, to, to get to, to know them a little better. But, but little Paisley was born. There were some big complications, but as far as I understand today, she's still in little Paisley's in NICU, but uh, things are going well, and, and it seems to be that out of the woods, so to speak. And so they are very appreciative of the prayers of, of this church family and the Christians here. And we just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to pray for them. And it's meant the world to them. And let's continue to pray for Paul and Rachel and little Paisley as well. And I know this, this is a, a different request perhaps, but Brother Jim Alley. He's been trying to find his keys to his vehicle, and he can't find them, and it's quite an ordeal to try to get a new key, apparently made for that vehicle. And uh, his wife, Mary, needs a different, different trips to the hospital and doctor's appointments. I don't think that it's below the, the power of God just to be able to help in this situation, and he's able to do something special there. So let's pray for, for Jim Alley and Mary Alley, and that God would just help in that situation. He knows all about it. And let's continue to pray for the needs in this time together. Would you stand with us again? And uh, if you see uh, Roan and Judy Faye after the service, be sure to wish them a happy anniversary. I believe it's number 60 number 60 for them. Be sure to wish them happy anniversary, but he's going to come and lead us in prayer, and let's join in with him. Let's pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are so privileged, so blessed. You're so good to us, Lord. We thank you for the wonderful grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that makes the victory that we were singing about a reality. We praise you for what you've done in our own life and the lives of many that are here tonight. We thank you for what you've already done in this revival meeting. Oh, we thank God for the word that's been preached and the music and everything. The worship of God has been a wonderful atmosphere to worship you in, and we thank you for it. And Lord, again tonight, we pray thy blessing upon Brother Manley as he breaks the bread of life. As he ministers to us tonight, anoint him and bless him. And Lord, help us to have receptive hearts. Help us to respond to the truth with obedience and faith. Lord, we pray you'll bless, you'll bless the special song. May it minister to our hearts and provide every need of the revival. May more victories be won. May people come to Christ. May God be glorified, and may a real revival be born, and we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. For the cross of Calvary, I could never thank him enough 
for salvation full and free i could never do anything to deserve such perfect love oh for everything he's done i can never praise him enough for many years i served the lord the best that i know how giving unto him my time telling of his power but if i were to spend unending hours on my knees praising him for everything that he's ever done for me i could never praise him enough for the cross of calvary i could never thank him enough for salvation full and free i could never do such perfect love oh for everything he's done i can never praise him enough a thousand tongues could never tell just what the lord has done as if he hadn't done enough he sent his only son to hang upon a rugged cross and bear the load of sin that explains why I can't express the love I have for him. I could never praise him enough for the cross of Calvary. I could never thank him enough for salvation full and free. I could never do anything to deserve such perfect love. Oh, for everything he's done, I could never praise him. So I'll say thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. I could never do anything to deserve such perfect love. Oh, for everything he's done, for everything he's done. Haven't you enjoyed the ministry of the Coles and Company? Uh, there have been just a, a great number of different ones that have been helping them out, and I love it. Family members, and, and we even got Sister Manley uh, in, in on the singing last night. It, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's ministered to my heart, and uh, I appreciated that song tonight, talking about us giving praise to God. And, and I think that the implication is that we can't praise Him enough, but that doesn't mean that we don't praise Him at all. It's a challenge to us to praise Him more. And, uh, and so one of the ways we can do that is in our giving. Yeah, I knew that was going to go over real well. Uh, but we do have some expenses for the revival, and uh, you have been giving in the last couple of evening offerings, and we so appreciate that. And tomorrow in the morning service, the young people from the academy and college, they're going to be receiving an offering to try to do their best to contribute to, towards the revival expenses. Uh, but we need still about $6,000. And so if you have been paying any attention to what Pastor Matt has been saying, you'll realize that, that we are making progress, but progress is very, very slow. So uh, if you could help us out as God would have you to uh, give, even in this offering tonight. Let's not wait until Sunday night to take care of this, uh, but let's do our best just to give as the Lord has blessed us. And uh, do you believe in revival? Yes. Amen. I know that you do because you're here uh, tonight, and your church attendance means so, so much. Uh, just keep in mind these announcements. On Saturday, there's a men's breakfast from 8.30 to 9.30 in the student center. Uh, so keep that in mind. And then also there was a cell phone that was found a couple of evenings ago. Uh, it is a track phone. It does not have minutes. Uh, and it looks, um, it looks like it's an Android. I think it's an Android phone. Pastor Matt has the phone. And so uh, that is a very dangerous thing uh, because who knows what he will do with your phone. 
and uh, he'll take selfies, I'm sure. So anyways, you want to claim this before, uh, before too long, okay? So if you're missing a phone, uh, please let us know. Um, let's see. Ah, also, don't forget, we do have uh, a final uh, chapel service tomorrow morning, and we would love to have you come if you're available. Uh, 1045, God's been coming in those morning chapel services, and we certainly would invite you. And then Lord, let, let, let's also just plan to come tomorrow night, 730, right here, expecting God to move in these services. Amen. All right, let's pray and ask God's blessing on this offering tonight. Heavenly Father, it is a privilege, Lord, to give back to you a portion, Lord, of what you have given to us. And Lord, it's with a heart of gratitude and a heart of cheerfulness that we give to you tonight. Lord, we want to see your work go forward. We want to see your work advance. And Lord, we, we believe in these services. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to have a heart that would give to you and to your kingdom. And Lord, for the help that you uh, give and Lord, that is received through this offering, we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together and sing that chorus. Oh, Sue. time we're going to sing it but turn around shake hands with somebody let them know you're glad to see them in church tonight oh soon and very soon intend to make it. Amen? Amen. If you intend to make it, say amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for that beautiful offertory this evening, and thank you for your giving. Uh, we've been enjoying the ministry and the singing of the coals that we've heard, and they're getting ready to sing again, but as they're getting ready to sing, we do want to say it is such a delight to have the Gordons here, uh, all the way from Summerfield, and, uh, but it's not because they really wanted to come to revival. They now have a granddaughter down here, Kylie, Kaylee uh, Steinbrickner. And uh, so good to have you all here. And it's also good to have uh, Professor uh, Halstead with us. And so good to see you. You were a tardy one tonight. I noticed that. And so uh, grace and mercy tomorrow. You understand. <laughs> so, good, so good to see you, each and every one. Lord bless the coals as they minister. And after which, Brother Manley brings the evening message. Let me just say, after service tonight, we'll be having auditions for anyone else that would like to sing. This, these that have sung so far begged us to do it, and we finally let them, so we got them out of the way, so now it's, no, I'm kidding. But uh, I do want to say I love the Lord tonight, and I'm so thankful for His love and His mercy and His grace in my life. 
I'm so unworthy. When I look back over my life and, and think about my unworthiness, it, it's overwhelming to think that a God so great, a God so mighty would look down and consider me worth it to come down and, and to die for me. But I'm so thankful by his blood he's made us worthy tonight. Thankful for the Lord tonight. song. Good evening. <laughs> Man, we just need a cup of coffee and a blanket, and we're, we're just cozy. It feels really good. Nothing like some rain in the atmosphere. To, and, and a bowl of popcorn, too. Would, would, that, would that suit for everyone tonight? If you thought I was going to Genesis 35 tonight, you're right, because that's, that's where we're going if you have a copy of the scriptures and want to go there. For those of you that have already been here in the last couple of evenings, you know that we've been talking about one of the characters that takes up a good space in the Old Testament by the name of Jacob. He was part of God's plan to bring redemption to the world. But even though God has plans for people, sometimes people mess those up. But God doesn't give up easily. God could have very easily passed every one of us by, but you are here tonight, and I'm here tonight because there's a redeeming God 
who will work with us and help us. We're talking about the rebuilding years of Jacob's life, and there's times where God orchestrates some deep cork course corrections for us. I'm glad God can do that because sometimes we look at some people maybe or maybe at our own selves sometimes and we say it's never going to change. Oh, but don't, don't say that too soon because God has an amazing way of changing things. Isn't it nice to see things that are running well, running smoothly? I mean, isn't it, isn't it great to go to a restaurant where everything is just right? I mean, amazing how efficient some places have learned to operate. Businesses come to mind as I'm thinking about that. It's, it's neat to see a team that plays very well together, a well-oiled machine, we call it sometimes, where, I mean, they know how to pass and they know how to... Uh, perform and they they know how to complete and score and all of those things and, and it's good to be part of a team that's performing well bump and set and spike like some of you do so well it's nice for mechanics to hear a, an engine hum I, I know guys that get excited when they hear a good truck run through all the gears just just work through all those gears that just it's like a spiritual experience for them. They, they just like that. There's nothing like when your internal world is in alignment with God. You know, God wants to do more than just kind of clean you up a little here and there on the outside and give you a little pat on the back and say you're, you're good. But you know, God really does want to do a deep internal work inside of us that that really gets us aligned to his way. You ever driven a car that's out of alignment? That's not a lot of fun, is it? Where if you let that wheel go, it just begins to pull to one side, and then for you to keep it going straight, you have to compensate by putting some tension on that wheel, and it gets old. It also wears out your tires. It's not good. You may not understand how that works with a car, but a lot of us understand how that is with a shopping cart. We, we, we find it's hard to get a good shopping cart because the more weight you get in it, the harder it is to push and the farther it wants to pull to one side or the other. And, but it sure is nice when something is aligned. I'm amazed at this early point in the revelation of God, the, the beginning chapters of Genesis, before the law is given, before the prophets have come, before the gospel is ever pre presented as clearly as we would come to know it, God begins to give pictures in the Old Testament of what he wants to do in the hearts of people. And it seems like God starts with object lessons in the Old Testament that he'll begin to explain throughout the redemptive history that's going to be recorded in the Bible. As we've told uh, more than once, Jacob and his family have really gotten off track, and, and yet God is working to faithfully bring them back. God's call to the altar, we talked about the first night, Tuesday night, is, is, is a call to reestablish contact with him. And that's where it really begins. When, when we're out of contact with God, it's amazing what can happen. Last night we talked about God's call to the altar is, is that call to, to make a spiritual recovery, a, a turnaround. To, my part of that also involves some personal responsibility and, and also exercising some spiritual leadership in those places where I have some influence. Tonight I want us to think about how God's call to the altar is a call to a deep realignment within me. And I want us to think what God would say to us, not just on a surface level, but from the depths of the motivations and the moving of our hearts, what really makes us tick. The beauty of what God wants to do is he, he wants to fix not just our way, but he wants to fix our want to and do something deep within us that calibrates us to his path. 
The psalmist prays in Psalm 119, verse 5, oh, oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes, that I could have that. So when God calls Jacob to the altar, he, he begins to realize there's, there's some things that ought to change. Although God doesn't spell them out, Jacob begins to know. And we can read them in verse 2 of Genesis 35. I won't take the time to read the entire passage again. But because he heard the voice of God, because he had contact with God, because he got a vision of meeting God again, and this time with his family, this is what he says. Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with them, with him, put away the strange gods or the foreign gods, the gods of the strangers technically, those gods we've picked up, those little idols. Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. Those three things that he said, I want to just drill down on for a little bit tonight. That first part that says, put away the gods of the strangers, or the strange gods that are among you. I think we could just simply put a handle on that as idols. Now in the ancient world, and of course in certain places of, of our world today, idol worship is very common. You, you understand there's places and people that are, are, are very uh, enamored with some type of physical, tangible representation of their spiritual affection. And though that may not be our problem so much, yet there is this sense that we, we are nature, by nature people who worship. We, we put our affections on things. And boy, we go crazy sometimes about some things. We, we build garages for some of those things. We build cabinets for some of those things. We buy bulletproof safes and fireproof safes for things like that. We put securities and annuities together for things like that. And, well, we take out insurance policies for things and just a variety of things or Maybe even dreams that aren't even something you can put in a box, but they're, they're something that has our affection. Somehow in the world that Jacob lived, he and his family had acquired some idols. <laughs> and if you're going to go worship and pray to the true and living God, uh, not a good idea to take idols with you. I say Jacob is using some good discernment right here. And in light of the God who is living and able and powerful, that God that Jacob met in the night when he was running for his life, that appeared with this ladder from heaven, this, this God who wrestled with him in the night as he was facing his brother the next day, this God that he would see when he'd promised that he would give an altar and make an offering to the God that would spare his life, when he saw in his mind Going back to the place of worship at Bethel, he says, all of the idols of our lives really shouldn't go with us. They stay here. Could it possibly be that a person like you or me would actually have something that could be called an idol? Perhaps my favorite definition of an idol or a description of it maybe could go like this. An idol is... What I want to do first, what I want to do most, and what I want to do best. It vies for my first affection, the most of my energy, and the best of my offering and sacrifice. But idols by nature put a wedge between us and God. They, they distort the voice of God. They, they begin to make us think that we can please God on one level, but also kind of have a, a substitute or a manageable God that we can put our hands on. It's very interesting to me to think that by this time of Jacob's history, his family have collected some idols. Now, if you know the story of Jacob, you'll, you'll remember he, he ran basically from home from the wrath of his brother. So I'm, I'm, 
I'm sure that his dad, Isaac, didn't have idols. I, I'm, I'm just sure of that. Because he'd been raised in a home to worship the true God. And, and so he doesn't carry any with him, I'm sure, when he's running for his life. But you remember he, he marries up uh, with a couple of girls whose dad had some idols. Laban, you remember? Laban had some idols. And when they were leaving Laban, do you, do you remember his wife Rachel took some of those those idols, those gods. I don't know. Maybe she swiped them off of the fireplace mantle. I, I don't know where he kept them. Maybe he had a shrine somewhere. And so when she was packing up, she took them and they headed out. And uh, Laban came after them and he was very interested in those gods. I, I don't know what they looked like. I don't know how much value they had. But they were important enough to Laban that he said, I want those back. And they were important enough to Rachel that she said, I'm willing to lie to you about where those idols really are. Here's what's fascinating. What was an idol to Laban became an idol to Rachel. And what was an idol to Rachel soon becomes an idol to the family of Jacob. So somewhere in that journey, where Jacob, when he was asked, where are the idols? He said, we don't have them. We don't know anything about them. And I think he's telling the truth. I don't think he was in on the plan that Rachel had to take the idols. But by the time we get to Genesis 35, they've got idols. Are they part of the ones that they swiped from Laban? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe they're just those among others. But whatever they are, they're, they're there. The thing that haunts me as a dad and maybe someday a grandpa is what's an idol to me could easily become an idol to my children. What's an idol to me could become an idol to my grandchildren. It doesn't take long for kids to pick up what really matters to us what we guard carefully, what raises our attention faster than anything else, those idols. In light of the holy God who he was ready to meet again at Bethel, Jacob said, those have got to go. I'm not here to spell out things that could easily be idols. That's the faithful work of the Spirit, which he will do. He knows. He knows what it is that has our attention. You ever notice how disappointing idols can be, though? They require an increasing amount of energy sometimes. They require an amount of, of money sometimes. They just... I mean, instead of our idols propping us up, we've got to keep propping them up. A great illustration of this is from 1 Kings chapter 5. Remember the Philistines had their, their idol named, named Dagon? And when they had captured the Ark of the Covenant, they thought, we'll just put the Ark right there in the same tent that we put our god Dagon there. And they went to check on their, <laughs> they went to check on their idol. Isn't that funny? Our god checks on us. We... We get idols and we have to check on them. So they, they go and check on them. And here, of all things, they find Dagon, the, the idol just falling on his face in front of the Ark of the Covenant. What in heaven's name do you do when your idol has fallen down? You've got to pick it up. You've got to lift it up. You've got to get it back in its place. Boy, that gets exhausting, doesn't it? All right. We've got our world back in order. We've got our idols in our place. They come back the next day, and there's, there's their idol back down on the ground. This time he's lost a few limbs, and it's just a powerful reminder. When we make idols, idols will fail us, they'll disappoint us, and they'll take energy from us instead of giving us energy. Oh, that God would give us the honesty and the clarity to see in our lives what's robbing us of our spiritual vitality. 
Some of that's just got to go if we're going to see a realignment in our life, if we're going to see a spiritual rebuild and a recovery. <laughs> I, remember, I remember a fellow that I had the privilege of pastoring years ago, huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I mean, he, he loved Steelers, and he loved everything Steelers. And so you go into his house, and there's everything Steelers. I mean, the cups that he drank from and the trash can he used, and every, everything had Steelers logos and emblems. It was just crazy about Steelers. One day I went into his house, and there was no Steelers stuff. Marv was a new Christian at that time. I said, I said, Marv, what in the world happened to your stuff? And Marv's not a well-educated fella. But he was in tune with the Spirit of God. And he said, you know, it bothered me. Every time my nieces and nephews would come over, they'd touch my stuff. And they, they'd rearrange my stuff. And I was always afraid they were going to break my stuff. And finally I realized my Steeler stuff's getting in the way. So he said, I just took it all out to the dumpster and I just threw it away. And some of you that don't like the Steelers thought that was a great idea, didn't you? But we have our team. <laughs> we, we have our favorites. And God wants to make sure there's nothing hindering us. You know, when God says, don't have any other gods before me, it's not that God is so insecure that he can't handle a rival. It's that he loves us so much that he knows that an idol will always disappoint you. It will never satisfy you. You will not find security in it. And the best thing you can allow him to do is to extract that idol from your life. He not only says, uh, let's put away those idols, let's, let's get rid of them. He, he also says something powerful. Be clean. Just be clean. So if, if you have to have it organized and alliterated, it's, he's dealing with idols and now he's dealing with impurities. This move to the altar is more than a religious experience that's empty and void, but it, it's a realignment with the holiness of God and his purity and coming to realize that I've got to be clean. I've got to be pure. Later, the psalmist would say in Psalm 24, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Who has any right to have an audience with God? And the answer comes, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. The family of Jacob had obviously become contaminated by the world around them. Though Jacob doesn't have the full knowledge of all of the revelation of God, he has this much that he's taken from the call of God to the altar to realize, I need to be clean. I need a cleansing. My family needs a cleansing. And so as we get ready to go, let's do this. You know that God still values the cleanness of a heart and life. Through the pages of his word, he is always calling us away from sin. But not just to set us on a shelf to be sterile, but he calls us unto himself, who is himself holiness and purity and altogether lovely. Come to me. He's not just saying, go to the altar and get yourself taken care of, but he's saying, Come and I will meet you there. And there's where your cleansing will be found. Be ye holy for I am holy, he says often. It's amazing to me that what can cut through the calluses of a self-righteous person like Isaiah perhaps had become by the time he gets to Isaiah chapter 6. He's easily telling people where they've gone wrong and what they're doing. But when he sees the Lord high and lifted up, he says, woe is me. We've seen it, haven't we? We've heard it. We've known it. We've, we've been around it so much that it nauseates us sometimes that people that are just so self-righteous and so judgmental and so condemning and everything's wrong with everyone else. But oh, when you catch a glimpse of the holiness of God, 
Suddenly you realize it's not my brother or my sister, but it's, it's a me, O oh Lord, that stands in the need of prayer. This is Jacob saying, we need this. I'm reminded of that King David who, who for a, a number of months hides his sin, but only when he sees the, the amazing holiness of God, when God lowers the boom on him and says, thou art the man you're the one that's been hiding. You're the one that's been stealing. You're the one that's been committing adultery. He says, have mercy on me, O God. Wash me thoroughly from my sins. Create in me a clean heart, O God. You don't know it until you see it sometimes. You can't ask for it until you feel it sometimes. And if God is already, even right now, making you feel a little dirty, it's his mercy, it's his mercy that's calling us to a clean life. And that he wants to do. The arrogant fisherman who had an answer for everything when he saw the holiness of Jesus one day Peter fell on his face and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. God has an amazing way of awakening us to his holiness. God loves cleanness, cleanliness. It's still good to be clean. It's still good to have a clean heart and a clean conscience. It's good to have a clean browsing history. It's good to have a clean inbox, a clean outbox. It's good to have a clean view. It's good to have a clean mind where we don't entertain unholy fantasies and take mental joy rides down trails that take us away from the holiness of God. It's good to be clean. It's good to be clean from the defilements of the flesh and spirit, those spirit defilements that cause us to be mean and nasty and snarling tempers and bitter criticisms. It's, it's good to be clean from that. It's good to be clean in the flesh and in the spirit, I say again. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God, the Apostle Paul says. It's good to have a clean tongue. A clean tongue that doesn't speak evil. It resists the urge to gossip. It doesn't spill out poison and slander. It's, it's good to be clean. It's good to have a clean life. I'm amazed at how God worked in the Old Testament. I've, I've often been baffled sometimes when I read some of those Old Testament laws. I think of the holiness chapter in Leviticus 19 and some of those things, and I scratch my head and I say, what is the big deal? But when God tells his people, don't yoke an ox and donkey together. Every day when they hitch up their team, those farmers are reminded, we hitch clean animals with clean animals. Oxen are clean animals. A donkey is an unclean animal. Not only are they at a different height and a different body build, but they are unclean and clean. And he says, don't hitch them together. He says uh, to, to the lady that's sewing a patch on a garment, don't mix linen and wool together. And we, we look on that and we say, what, what's the big deal? If it works, what's the problem? But you know what? That object lesson that God is teaching his people, even when they sew a patch on a torn garment is... There's a separation between two kingdoms. Wool comes from the animal kingdom. 
Linen comes from the plant kingdom. Don't co-mingle those kingdoms. And you're a special people. You are a prized possession. You are a holy nation. You've been made for my glory and for my presence. Even when you sew a patch on a broken garment, be reminded, I want all of you and I want the purest parts. And I'll cleanse the dirty parts. And i got to tell you, as I begin to see this God, even in those dry passages of the Old Testament, I begin to say, oh, how beautiful you are, oh God, that you could take my heart and make it one, that you could take those divided and broken parts of me and clean it into one unit. Though this is not all, I'm sure, in the mind of Jacob when he says, let's be clean, we're going to the altar. <laughs> the seeds of what God wants to do in the hearts of all of humanity are beginning to be brought into the lives of people right here in Genesis 35. Be clean, be clean. <laughs> and he says, change your garments. He, he, he addresses the idols and the impurities, and then uh, I would just say the inconsistencies. The, you know, that garment is, is, not, is not conducive for this journey. This, this is not, not going to go well for our plans ahead. So he says, change, change your garments. Put on a fresh outfit. What's happening on the inside of us should also be reflected on the outside of us in some way, Jacob is saying. God is doing a deep realignment in my heart, Jacob is communicating to his family. And so let's go ahead and let it show on the outside that, that we are consistently desiring an inner purity and an outer purity. My friends... My young friends, I'll say to you specifically, you don't have to be ashamed of that. You don't have to be afraid of that. Because when the heart is all in on doing what God wants you to do, you just let him lead whatever the outside's going to be. And if it's different than the world around you, if it sets you apart from somebody else, it's quite all right. Because having a consistency of inner purity and outer purity is a sweet way to live. You know how nice it is to go to Chick-fil-A and things are just working like this? It's because they have some consistency in their policies. You know how good it is to see a winning team season after season? It's because they have some fundamentals that are consistent that they work on over and over again. And you know the consistency of the life that God wants to be for you and me. It's when he's got the internal and the external in good alignment with his eternal plans for our lives. <laughs> and this is the turnaround that God wants to do in Jacob's life and in ours. My time is gone. God is speaking to us, and I, I just wonder tonight, perhaps we could just have some music. Is, is, there any, is there any hunger, any longing in somebody's heart tonight that says, I... I want that alignment inside of me. I, I, I want my inner world to be in alignment with God, and I want it to work outward from there. I don't want idols to hinder. I don't want impurities of any sort. I don't want any inconsistencies in my life. I really want to turn all to God. As we stand together tonight, this altar is open. The rebuilding years of our life are more than just moving, changing an address, but they're, they're going deep into who we are and what, what motivates us and what moves us and what keeps us going.
is a good moment for us to just do a little inventory, a little scan of the heart by the Spirit of God and say, where, where are things within? I recognize it's also the kind of message that for some of us it, it opens new thoughts and channels and whole compartments within us that sometimes we haven't explored so much. And we need to talk to God about that. We, we need to do some digging. Maybe we need to talk to somebody about that. And I respect that. There have been times that I haven't gone to an altar of prayer, but the faithful Spirit of God has pressed some buttons that I knew the next time I'm praying, we're talking about these because He's on it. He's, he's unrelenting. And if that's you tonight, I, I want to caution you to cultivate that Spirit and not shut it down. It's very easy as soon as we're finished from this moment, the noise fills back up the atmosphere of our lives. The busyness, the schedule, the push and the pull. The next thing you know, we're feeling that tension again of being pulled God's way, but pulled another way. And oh, God wants to make a deep alignment in us that makes it easier for us to go God's way. So tonight I leave you with this truth and I leave it in the hands of the Holy Spirit. If there's others that want to pray tonight, you're, you're welcome to do that. You're encouraged to do that. If you're of the mind tonight that you know that there's business you need to do with God privately, I respect that too. And I welcome you tonight. The Spirit's presence is very real. He's not complicating it. He's putting it pretty clearly and plainly for us. I respect these who come. Appreciate that. So you have a lot to do. This is the most important thing you could do. Just let God take care of it. Amen. Anybody else coming? I want all the kingdoms of my heart to be brought into one. Oneness of heart. It's the holiness message, an undivided heart, clean hands, pure heart. All of God and all of me. Amen. Let's gather for prayer for those who are here. If you need to do some praying on your own, you just take the time you need. God bless you. Thank you for being here.